people tend to explore spaces a lot more than they ever have before. And I think part of that is the natural intuition. So when you see something interesting, you're like, oh, hey, look at that. It looks great. And you just move your head, right? There's no abstract control of where you're looking. The point is that people do tend to look at art assets a lot more. In fact, in our earliest demos, you'd see people just not playing the game, but just walking around. And I think if you come by the booth and try Hawking, for example, you'd be flying around this awesome cityscape, and people are like, dude, this just looks so freaking cool. Um, and the problem is for artists that uh, you really do need to, to take the time to make great, um, highly detailed assets, right? And simple textures, conversely, do make items sometimes look like props. So, you know, in some of the earliest ports we did or some of, you know, the Unity demos we made when we were just making up our own textures, for example, things just look silly. They looked fake in the world. And it really depends on the style of game. You know, TF2, for example, they don't necessarily need, like, really high-quality bump mapping because that's their art style. They've got that, you know, more comic-esque uh, art style. But for a lot of games, if you're going for a more realistic tone, you really do need to take the time to do your art well. And players will appreciate you for it. I think most artists are like, dude, people are finally looking at my stuff. They're not just sprinting by it trying to shoot the next zombie. So visual identity is something super interesting, and it falls right in line with players look down and they say, I'm four feet tall and I have no body, hands or feet. This is a, a challenge. I mean, most games, you know, you look down and, and game developers just, there's no need necessarily to put the body of the player there. You know, FPS games, you do have your hands, but when you look down and you see disembodied hands without feet, it only looks worse. So as game designers, you want to look at how do you provide visual identity to players and how do you actually give them a sense of presence in the world. They'll appreciate it. And if you come by the booth and try, or maybe some of you have tried, the TF2 demo, Valve's done an incredible job of when you are the heavy, or any class in the game, and you look down and you see yourself holding that minigun, it just feels awesome. Um, and it really does make you feel like you're the heavy and not a floating head you know, with a minigun sticking out of your chest. Just as a neat aside, try mirrors. Uh, it's really neat to watch people sort of be Nathan Drake or Marcus Phoenix or whoever it is, and then walk up to a mirror and see that character rather than themselves. It's very cool in VR. So how do we provide extra information to the player? And what I mean by that is really what do user interfaces look like in virtual reality? So this is a screenshot from Hawken. Hawken is actually one of the, the best looking Oculus Rift demos we've got. But I wanted to bring this up because in the demo we have downstairs, we actually don't have the UI on. And modern UI for a lot of games does look like this, right? You've got a lot of additional information coming into the player visually uh, spread throughout the screen. You've got mini maps, scoreboards, logs, reticles, all that stuff. Now, Hawken actually is a perfect fit because you'll notice some of their UI is already integrated into the mech cockpit. And I think that's one of the first things people notice. They're like, wow, it's awesome to look at my dashboard and see my health, right? But what do you do with all the rest of that stuff? The bottom line is that user interfaces in virtual reality are incredibly challenging in an exciting way. And the way we go about providing information to the player does need to change. And there's really three primary challenges with the existing sort of standards for UI. So the first and foremost, I'm going to go with immersion since that's, you know, what VR is about. The second is going to be XY position. You know, where do we actually put the UI on screen if you are living in the game. And finally, Z position, which is something uh, some of you maybe have dealt with before porting your games over to a 3D setting. There are challenges there, and we'll talk about that. So historically, 2D interfaces, they're often on the periphery of our screens. You know, developers for a long time realized players want to focus on the game. Let's put the UI on the outskirts, right? But the challenge becomes, you know, if you're completely immersed in that world, there's not necessarily a good place for the UI. So Dead Space, uh, you know, as a series, has done an incredible job with immersion. I think that's one of the things that does make it so successful and uh, such a scary game, right? And they've gone about approaching it where they've integrated a lot of the extra information into the game world, similar to the way we saw Hawk in it with the, uh, the cockpit. So if you're unfamiliar with Dead Space, um, we have Isaac there shooting something. And on his back, that's actually his health bar. And then the semicircle on his side, I think it's called stasis or magic or something. It's been a while since I played Dead Space. But the point is that 
you know, these, this information is provided to the player in a way that is completely integrated with the game world, and that makes for an awesome, immersive setting. So just jumping back to XY position, in a really simplistic sense, the challenge is just that there's not enough screen real estate for everything you want to put on screen. If we're wrapping the world around you and the center of the screen is the part that you know, looks the best, where your focal point is most of the time, you don't want to just slam your UI into that space, right? Because that's where the player, just if we go back to Space Invaders, that's, they want to see the game, not the UI. Just to give you an idea of just how challenging this is, I mean, Valve for TF2, uh, when they released the VR mode, I know that they exper experimented with a number of implementations that at the end of the day, they just shrank it um, into the, the FOV, and it's not perfect, but it, it works. You've got to think about new ways to provide that information to the player. What we're finding is that the best UI really is 3D. So if you're going to put something on the screen that isn't going to be completely integrated into the game world, then where do you put it at? What Z depth do you put it at? And I'm going to try a shoddy demonstration at explaining this to you for those of you that haven't implemented this before. So bear with me and just humor me for a second. So if you guys all raise up your right hand or your left hand, some of you please, just so I know some people are doing it. All right, and then uh, line it up basically with me. So everyone should have their thumb lined up with me, right? Now, if you switch back and forth between converging on your thumb and me, you'll notice that you're seeing either two of me or two of your thumb in most cases, right? Now, if you keep doing that for a second and you actually bring it closer uh, and then try and switch back and forth, you'll notice it takes your eyes about a half a second to switch focal po points, right? So. What that, what the reason I'm showing you guys that is because you could think of that like a reticle in the game world, right? So you want to put a reticle into the world. Well, where are you going to put it? If you put it close to me, your target, right? That looks pretty good, but you need to get it all the way there or else you're going to see two of it. If you bring it up close, then it makes it incredibly difficult for the player to switch convergences between the reticle on screen and me. This is a major challenge. It was one of the first things when we got the Rift working and we started playing with UI. And you just see so much double UI, right? You just put the UI on screen and you focus far away and the whole UI here, you just see two of it. And you're like, wow, got to fix that. So, you know, one thing we've recommended, and I don't think that's here, is actually moving the reticle and painting it sort of on the target that we wanted, that the player would be focused on, right? So if I'm aiming up close here in the audience, I would actually render the reticle here, painted on these people. Sorry. And if I'm aiming out there, I'd actually move the target, uh, the reticle out there. And that does basically resolve the problem, right? It feels good and people are like, yeah, that's awesome. So now the problem is that's a reticle. That's one dot on the screen, one circle. What do you do when you want to put a scoreboard on screen? You know, are you going to move the scoreboard through the world in, in stereo depth? I mean, it really does become a challenge. And you need to think about these things when you're building your UIs. Um, and to me, it goes back to, what are the ways that virtual reality is different, right? How can we make it more like the real world? Um, and I think what Mike alluded to in, in a lot of ways is, for example, different input devices. I mean, there's, you're going to have a lot of flexibility as VR matures as a platform. The Rift, we're stuck with that visual aspect, right? But you can imagine in Fallout 3, for example, they do the Pip-Boy. So whenever you bring up the menu, you know, your character brings his hand up and it basically takes over the screen. I don't know about taking over the screen, but bringing up something like that and it's totally reasonable, right? The more the UI, again, more like Dead Space or Grand Theft Auto where you pick up your cell phone, the more it's integrated with the world, the more immersive it's going to be and actually the better it's going to feel for the player. We're finding you don't really want, you know, 2D UIs stapled to your face, basically, right? It just, it, if it's always on you and you can't shake it off, it feels weird, right? So just for the developers out there who might be interested in how the heck do I port my existing UI now that you've told me that UI is, you know, really tough. Um, you know, what Valve did is, I think, an easy way to sort of solve it temporarily, and that's, you know, make it fit within the safe zone, shrink it down. You can also make it toggleable, right? You have a scoreboard. Your scoreboard's not always on screen. You can bring it up when, only when the player wants to see it, and maybe that helps with the immersion. But again, I think as developers, we really want to be exploring totally new ways to provide people data, right? Imagine. If we get hands in there, and you know, that's what VR is all about, getting more of you in the game. So if you've got your hands and you can see your hands, you can imagine maybe a gesture over your arm like opens up a menu, right? Same Pip-Boy idea. And then you can actually interact with it. And those are the types of experiences that are going to be the most fun, right? I mean, that sounds pretty cool to me. Hopefully it sounds cool to you guys too. Um, and this is what you should be excited about, right? Is trying to find new ways for the player to interact with the world, trying to make it more like real life.
Immersion is all about matching player input. Um, you know, Mike already went into this in great detail, but it's really at the crux of it, right? We need the perspective in the virtual world to match the player's perspective. And I think one of the most frequently asked questions is, all right, so it's an obvious fit for first person games, you know, that's it. So, you know, what's next for Oculus? It's, Whoa, hang on a second. There's a lot of applications in a lot of different genres, and I think what you're gonna see is as soon as we ship um, our developer kits, uh, the developers are gonna be experimenting with first person games, third person games, RTS games. I mean, in a lot of ways, the sky's the limit. You know, it's all about how you want to design your game and your storytelling. Again, if we're going for immersion and the difference between VR and, and a 2D monitor is going to be immersion, there's a, a completely different experience if I'm sitting on my couch controlling Marcus Phoenix or Baird or whoever that is in front of me in Gears of War and being right behind Baird, looking around the world, you know, the Gears of War universe with, you know, they have those volcanic ash like falling and things flying over you. You look up and you see things go by. And the fact is you do feel immersed. It's a completely different way to play your games. Just be aware of it. I mean, you can do a lot with the world and I think people will do some really, really neat stuff. You can imagine like a squad based game where you're controlling the first person. You can look behind you, see where your squad is and things like that. I think even perhaps more interesting, or at least incredibly interesting, is uh, storytelling. And this is something we talked about sort of on the South by Southwest panel, uh, if any of you guys saw that. Uh, but how do you move the player through a story without taking away control? Putting the player uh, VR, you know, making them feel like they're in the world, if you take away control, it, is, it can be a jarring experience, right? For example, if you're running through a field and a cutscene starts and the camera pulls back and it starts panning over this vista and all this stuff, you're like, I was back there somewhere, now I'm flying over a vista. And a lot of games, they don't have head look during cutscenes. You know, cutscenes, movies, storytelling on the whole really does need to be designed from the ground up. And I think Palmer always brings up a fantastic example, and that's Half-Life 2, right? Half-Life 2 was told through the eyes of Gordon Freeman alone. And when they wanted to do something, where they wanted to show you some other part of the story where Gordon Freeman wasn't, he would watch a movie or a monitor, or someone would you know, come and meet him and be like, hey, have you heard about what's going on over here? That's what VR is gonna be like. And it's not necessarily, again, about um, necessarily first person, but you're gonna wanna stick with that player through the world, and it's gonna be a challenge. You know, Even beyond cutscenes and movies, another challenge is loading screens. In UDK, for example, we, we mentioned this in our Kickstarter update, but some of the things we did are, so people might consider strange, but we added head look to all the loading screens, and we added head look to all of the cutscenes, because all the cutscenes in Unreal Engine are done, you know, real time. And it improves the experience so drastically, you wouldn't even believe it. I mean, no one wants to be staring at a loading screen stuck on their face. When the loading screen's out in front of you and you can look around and, and feel like you're, you know, looking at it, it's awesome. So I want to talk for a minute about simulator sickness. Immersion in a lot of ways is a double-edged sword, right? We've already talked about that in terms of UI, in terms of art assets. The ability to put a player in the world is intense, right? People take off the rift and they say, damn, I felt like I was there. And that's exactly what you know, we're going for. That's what VR should be like. VR can be as visceral an experience or as relaxing an experience as you make it. And a lot of this is gonna be up to the games that you guys build. So in terms of simulator sickness, people ask us sometimes, you know, why do I feel sick uh, after, you know, falling out of the sky in, you know, some of our demos. So there's really no widely accepted cause for simulator sickness, but I'm gonna break it down into four main parts. And uh, I think Mike has already really highlighted this a lot, but the first two are latency and tracking precision. So you need the world, the player's input to match up directly to the game world, right? So if the player turns their head and the world slowly drags behind them in the virtual space, it does make for a disorienting experience. And that's a lot of times what can make some people dizzy. So now that the latency is actually there, where we're you know, closing in on the 40 millisecond range and it does feel super tight, it starts to move to tracking precision. And how closely are we nailing those movements, right? The player turned from here to here. All right, well, how good was our sensor fusion in um, in nailing that down. And in the SDK, we do a lot of neat things in terms of head and neck modeling, like Mike mentioned, but also predictive tracking, you know, trying to guess where the player's head is going so that we can actually minimize perceived latency. Positional tracking is definitely gonna be another thing, right? If the player does this and the world leans with them, it's not a great experience. It's not immersive. You feel, you're like, 
that, that was completely wrong. So we gotta fix that. Um, so some of it's on us, some of it's on you guys. Moving right along to content, the perfect kind of simple example is, uh, you know, if you make a game where you put the player in a fighter jet and now they're flying over the sky, they can look down, you know, in some planes you see right out the cockpit into the sky below, they're like, okay, this is intense. And then you start making them do barrel rolls. Players are going to get motion sickness straight up. I mean, they'll feel like they're there. I, there's a small percentage of people that get motion sick playing, you know, games on a 2D monitor. Well, now you're taking the person and putting them in that game. And if the experience is intense, it can make people just dizzy. I mean, it's completely expected, right? If I grabbed anyone from the audience and spun you around in circles, you'd be, you know, whoa, I feel dizzy. Yeah, it's real life. I mean, that's what we're simulating, right? And then leading right through that is the player. Every person is unique. Some people walk up, they say, I've never gotten motion sick in my life. They sit down, they play, they're like, I'm a little dizzy. Other people say, I can't get on a boat, I throw up. They sit down and they say, that was, Flying and hawking was the best gaming experience I've ever had. Every player is going to be different. So think about that when you're designing your games, um, and we're going to talk about this in, in just a second. What sort of experience do you want to take the player to? Awesome. So if virtual reality is about putting the player into the world, right, we're going for immersion, where do you want to take players? And I think you need to think about this as designers a lot. I like to use two examples, and that's flying and falling. So. When people fly for the first time in Epic Citadel or Hawken or something, they are just, that's it. This is what they've always dreamed of. Or, you know, in some of the earliest ports we did or some of, you know, the Unity demos we made, um, a super high cliff, we'd tell people to go and look over the edge, and they would, and then we'd tap W on the keyboard and they'd fall off. And people go, oh, sh And, I mean, that's an experience, right? The point I'm, I'm trying to get at is that you now have control of someone's visual cues, right? They feel vertigo, they feel scared leaning over that edge, they feel like they're falling. We're tricking your brain as best we can and I think we're doing a pretty damn good job of it. Um, so the point is that you are now in control. You are sort of the architects of these experiences. You gotta think about where you wanna take the player and how they should move around those worlds. So, you know, people say to me, the rift is for Call of Duty, Hawken, that's it. And I think that's totally not the case. I think you need to think about where would you really rather be. If I said, okay, I can take you to Iraq, you're gonna be sprinting through streets, people are gonna be shooting at you, your friends are gonna be dying, you're running at 40 miles an hour, awesome. Or, or uh, you know, you can be flying through a field, this is a flower, sort of just soaring in a vast open space with pretty lights and pretty colors and it's gonna be pretty comforting. So, one description inspires a little bit of fear if you think about really actually going there and living that experience, and the other inspires a relaxing sensation. And this is what you guys are gonna start um, you know, experimenting with. You're gonna have all these types of experience where some are exploring you know, a house or a vista, like the Tuscany demo that Mike showed you. You know, that's sort of at one end of the spectrum. You start, you look around, you're in a really neat space, and you're like, wow, it's really pretty here. And, and one of our guys, Peter, always says like, I love working on that demo because I get to take a little vacation every day, right? And that's cool. And then there are gonna be gamers who just want to drop into Call of Duty, skydive out of a, a plane, land, and go sprinting through the streets. And that's cool too, but it's intense, right? If you are actually doing it, it's, it's different than doing it on a monitor. And I think if you guys try TF2, what Valve said you know, right off the bat in, in their wiki is that you know, people could play the heavy for a while, you know, sort of lumbering through the world at real world speeds. But you drop the first time players into the scout and they go zooming across the field, literally at 40 miles an hour, double jumping, being able to flip anywhere. And players are like, whoo, okay, that was a little bit intense. As developers, you gotta think about what sort of speed and intensity do you want for your games, right? Humans aren't used to performing superhuman feats all the time. That's why, for example, fighter jet pilots actually train in fighter jets and simulators and that sort of thing. So they build up and they acclimate, right? It's, part of that is gonna be there for VR. And it's not gonna be for all demos. You can imagine Minecraft in VR, I actually think it'd be relaxing, but at the same time, I think it would be a little scary, right? Your night falls and you, you know, carve out your little cocoon somewhere. That's very, very different, again, than, you know, Nathan Drake being punched out of an airplane and then falling, you know, miles to the ground. So, 
you got to figure this out for yourselves. And I think there's going to be an audience for both sides of the spectrum. Absolutely. I think, I, I'm sure a lot of people in here are like, black ops, yes, let's do it. I think there are gonna be a lot of other gamers and, and other audiences excited about those more relaxing, sort of immersive experiences that allow them to do things they've never tried before. So the last thing I just wanted to talk about really briefly is multiplayer. And multiplayer is, for me, you know, I don't play many games anymore just in terms of we're always, you know, working. But when I do play games, 99% of the time it's with my friends and I'm, experiencing something with them. And I think that with VR, multiplayer is, uh, it's gonna be reborn in a lot of ways that make it just incredibly cool. The difference between sitting on your couch and seeing a representation of you know, your best friend as pixels on a screen is one thing. But to be in that world and to be like, you know, hey Mike, and to, to wave at Mike, and, and you know, as we go, you can wave at me back. <laughs> And to, to be in that world and actually feel, again, it's all those things. It's the scale, right? It's like Mike is actually the same size as me and looks cool. And in fact, this goes back to one of our earliest demos. We had these monsters popping out of corridors, attacking people, right? People would scream and fall out of their chair. They'd be like, the thing looks, you know, 10 feet tall. And it, it is, right? It's the scale of the world. The, the monster was modeled to be huge. Um, well, now your friends, they're actually the right size. As VR matures as a platform, there are going to be all sorts of new ways to interact with them. You can imagine something like Second Life or a virtual Wikipedia where it's like, hey guys, like, let's go to the Colosseum in Rome. And why don't we like, go check it out, explore it, whatever. And you guys are like, sure, let's do it. And we walk through some library and we teleport to the Colosseum. We drop down and we're looking around and experimenting. And I think that's going to be, you know, there's going to be all sorts of new ways to experience things with your friends. I think. The, the social aspect is probably one of the most exciting things. So just to wrap up this talk, um, and I've covered all sorts of strange things now, this really is day zero for VR gaming. I think you know, Mike has said it and I say it, and it really is true. I mean, this, this technology really wasn't possible uh, 10 years ago, and the stars have sort of aligned, and you know, there's platforms now like Kickstarter where we can do crazy things, and if people support us, then they actually happen, so thanks again. But it really is the beginning, and this is a community-driven effort, and you guys as developers and, and designers should be excited because it's gonna be awesome. You know, we'll solve all these challenges together, and we'll do what we can to provide more interesting hardware for you guys to um, experiment with.